In this video, I will show you how to process data in Batch using Upsolver with Data Stored in S3 and write the results into Snowflake. First, I'll show you a simple batch load of data into Snowflake. Then, I'll show you how to join data in Upsolver and load the result into Snowflake. Upsolver is a managed service that makes it easy, fast, and safe to move data between source systems and your data warehouse or data lake. Upsolver provides powerful observability features to catch data and schema issues before they create problems downstream. We will use Upsolver's SQL Lake product to create a simple pipeline to process historical data. We'll do this processing in batch, which works for situations where latency or age of data isn't as important. Upsolver's batch processing isn't limited to files, as we can process data from other systems. We'll take some data stored in S3, process it using Upsolver, and load it into Snowflake. Upsolver pipelines guarantee exactly once and strongly order delivery of data as it's ingested. We need to do a few things to process data in batch with Upsolver. First, we need to create and configure a connection to S3. Second, we must create a table definition in the data lake where raw data will be stored. This will define the columns and types. Third, we need to create a job that copies the data from S3 into the data lake using Upsolver. That gets the data ready to be moved to Snowflake. Fourth, we need to create a table definition in our destination system. In this video, I'll show you how to do this in Snowflake. Finally, we must create a job that copies the data from Upsolver to Snowflake. We'll go through the exact steps in just a second, but I want to show you how to run your queries in Upsolver first. This is Upsolver's web interface. You can start using Upsolver right now for free with the developer sandbox. It has templates for various use cases, including the SQL queries we'll cover in this video. To get started, go to https colon forward slash forward slash sqlake.upsolver.com. At the SQL prompt, we can type in our query. You'll notice that Upsolver gives us syntax highlighting and even code completion using control plus spacebar. I'll click on execute. Make sure that our cursor is on the line of the statement that we want to execute. You can also use the keyboard by pressing control plus enter. Our first step is to create a connection to S3. A connection to S3 allows us to access data stored in S3 via Upsolver. You'll notice that there are some AWS role information and external ID access controls that we need to have retrieved from Amazon Web Services. There are two ways of integrating Upsolver into your AWS account. One uses a VPC and the other configures an IAM policy to access S3. If your data cannot leave your AWS VPC, deploy Upsolver in your VPC. You can connect to AWS resources using cross-account IAM policies, which makes connectivity quick and simple, but data will be processed in the Upsolver VPC. I'll show you how to connect using cross-account IAM policies. Log into AWS and go to IAM roles and click on the Create role. For trusted entity type, choose AWS service. Under Use Case, choose S3, click on Next. Click on Create Policy. In the Create Policy, click on JSON. Go to the link shown here to copy and paste the JSON into the window. You must change two sections of the JSON to fit your configuration. In the middle resource section, change the bucket name to match the name of your bucket. In the bottom resource section, change the bucket name and pass to match the names of the folders in S3 you want to make accessible in Upsolver. Click on Next Tags. Click on Next Review. Give the policy a name and click on Create Policy. With the policy created, we can use the ARN. Copy the full ARN from the page and replace the ARN in the AWS underscore role field. This ARN will allow access to the folders in S3 that you configured access for. If you use your own data in these examples, remember to change the paths to your buckets and S3 paths. 
Once our connection is created, we need to create a table. This table creation gives the column names and types that Upsolver will expect to find in the files. Upsolver supports the most common data types. Upsolver supports other advanced features when creating tables. We can partition our table by creating a column. By specifying a column, we could use a date to limit how much data a query has to run on. Another common feature is using primary keys to mark fields that are unique identifiers for a row. We click on Execute. A new tab is created, letting us know the task is done. We're missing two critical pieces of information, the file location and a way of telling Upsolver to work on the data. We accomplish this by specifying a job. A job in Upsolver is responsible for moving data from the source into Upsolver Managed Data Lake for staging and processing. This job will continue to run and copy any existing, and later on, new data that is added to the source S3 location. Please note that you may need to wait a few minutes for the job to start populating data. You'll declare the bucket and prefix in the job creation. That must correspond to the location in S3 where that data is stored. If this location isn't correct, we will get an error. We can query it now that we've created our table and job. If you're already familiar with SQL syntax, this query will look very familiar. The syntax familiarity is designed so that users with SQL skills can start using Upsolver immediately. A DevOps or data engineer can create the connections and staging tables to make it even easier for users to implement business use cases with these datasets. I like to run a select query after creating a table to ensure everything works correctly and the data returns as expected. When I clicked on Execute, the query was submitted to Upsolver. The results are displayed in a tab at the bottom. Now we can view the query results and ensure everything is what we're expecting. I take a quick look to ensure all of the types and column names match up. We'd use a regular select query to peek at the data as we did. We'd often use them for quick discovery or verifying that a table we create works as expected. Because the staging tables are stored in the data lake and metadata are maintained in AWS Glue Data Catalog, you can also use other data lake query engines like Amazon Athena or Starburst. Our goal is to move this order data from S3 and into Snowflake. To do this, we must add some things in Upsolver and Snowflake. Let's start with Upsolver. In Upsolver, we need to create a Snowflake connection. We'll use Snowflake's JDBC functionality to add data with Upsolver. You'll need to update your URL to correspond with the URL of your Snowflake cluster. In this example, the URL is in the AWS East 1 environment. You'll notice that we need our username and password credentials to access the Snowflake cluster. We need to go to our Snowflake environment for our next SQL query. With this query, we need to create a table in Snowflake where Upsolver inserts the data. You'll notice that this table creation matches the table definition in Upsolver, meaning that we're simply loading the source data as is into Snowflake without making any changes to it. In a more advanced use case, we may choose to transform the raw data using Upsolver, for example, to flatten nested fields, or mask sensitive information before loading the converted data into Snowflake. We click on Run to execute the query. Back in Upsolver, we need to create a job that moves the data from Upsolver into Snowflake. We start by configuring how often to run the job and where to start from. Then, we specify which Snowflake connection to use and which Snowflake table to update. Next, we write a select statement to model the data. In this example, we map the source column names to the target schema. Finally, we add a WHERE clause that Upsolver needs to copy just the data that has changed since the last run of the job. We'll click on RUN to start the job. We finished all of the piping and connections. The jobs are running, processing data, and copying it. We can see the fruits of our labor by returning to Snowflake and running a select query. It may take a few minutes for data to start populating in Snowflake. This query will be a sanity check 
that all of our data is moving correctly and to the right places. As we can see, everything is working perfectly for us. Now that we've done a simple batch job, we'll do a more complex one that includes joining two tables and saving the result in Snowflake. We can reuse the work that we've already done to load the web underscore traffic underscore data table. We'll need to create some new tables, create jobs, and do the join. We need to do a few things to join data sets with Upsolver. First, we need to create another table definition. This will define the columns and types. Second, as before, we need to create a job that copies the data from the source S3 into a staging table managed by Upsolver. This has to be separate from the other job we created because they're different paths and tables. Third, we create a materialized view that contains the last updated row from the second source table. Upsolver will join the first table with this materialized view. Fourth, we need to create another table definition for the resulting join data. Fifth, we need to create the job that does the join. This job will define how the tables are joined together. Sixth, we need to create a table definition in our destination system. In this video, we'll show how to do this in Snowflake. Finally, we must create a job that joins and copies the data from Upsolver to our destination system. Each job represents a step in the pipeline. Upsolver automatically synchronizes the execution of jobs to run in the same window of data. If one job stops receiving data, the ones that depend on it will pause until data becomes available. This architecture means hiccups in data availability don't result in corruption downstream. We need to create another table. This table will define the data in the user underscore data table. In this example, we're letting Upsolver infer the columns and data types based on the source data. We create another job to load the user underscore data. We need to create this job because we're outputting to a new target table. Like before, I suggest doing a quick select statement to sanity check everything. This verifies everything is configured and working correctly. When I clicked on execute, the query was submitted to Upsolver. The results are displayed in a tab at the bottom. Now we can view the query results and ensure everything is what we expect. I take a quick look to ensure all of the types and column names match up. We can also click on the table name in the navigation tree to see the schema and data profile, including the top values, density of values, and uniqueness. We can also inspect the first seen and last seen times that a column was seen by Upsolver. This means that if a new column is added, you'll be able to tell immediately. We'd use a regular select query to peek at the data as we did. We'd often use them for quick discovery or verifying that a table we create works as expected. Now we're getting into the advanced features of Upsolver. Upsolver's way of doing lookups against an aggregated view of a specific table is a materialized view. In this case, we're creating a materialized view that acts as a lookup table for the user underscore data which is grouped by the user ID. You'll see it in the join syntax later, but the user ID is the field we'll be joining the two tables on. The next part of the query defines the select statement, configuring how the data will be laid out. You can see the last function being used. Materialized views are updated as new data is added. For example, if our user changes their address, we want our materialized view to update its data too. The last function returns the last value of the address or whichever column that arrived for that group. The group is defined by the group by clause. You can see the group by is on the user ID since that is what we'll be joining on. Other functions are being used. The address field didn't split out the zip or postal code in the source data. Using a combination of functions, we pull out the zip code. In this case, the zip code is the last field and is separated by space characters. We split using the split function. With the last element function, we choose the last item in the array created by the split function. The MD5 function creates a hash from the input, 
will create hashes for the password and credit card number so they are masked. We need to create another table. This table will contain the results of the joined data from the user underscore data and web underscore traffic underscore data tables. The columns and types match those of the source table. We also define the primary key as our user ID. We need to create another job to join the data. You'll notice that this job is more involved than the previous jobs we've created. This is because the job has to declare the select statement that defines how data will be laid out for the resulting table. Since we've created our join table definition to match the source tables, the columns are restatements of the names. We must add an alias for each column so that Upsolver knows the name we want to use. At the end of the query is where the exciting parts are. The web underscore traffic underscore data table is joined with the materialized view of the user data and not the original table. This is because Upsolver used the materialized view as a lookup table for the latest user data information. You can see the column we're joining with is the user ID. Finally, the WHERE clause stipulates that we should only look at the data that has changed since the last run of the job. A quick note that materialized views are not currently queryable. We need to return to our Snowflake environment for our next SQL query. With this query, we create a table in Snowflake where Upsolver inserts the data. You'll notice that this table create matches the join table definition in Upsolver. We click on Run to execute the query. Back in Upsolver, we need to create another job that moves the join data from Upsolver into Snowflake. We start by configuring how often to run the job and where to start from. Then we specify which Snowflake connection to use and where to insert the data in Snowflake. Next, we create a select statement that says the column names on each side. We specify these names in case the column names in each table don't match up. Finally, we add a WHERE clause that Upsolver needs to copy just the data that has changed since the last run of the job. We'll click on Run to start the job. We finish all of the piping and connections to get our joined data into Snowflake. These jobs are running, processing data, and copying it. We can see the results by returning to Snowflake and running a select query. It may take a few minutes for data to start populating in Snowflake. This query will be a sanity check that all of our data is moving correctly and to the right places. As we see, everything is working perfectly for us. What should you do if you don't see any data after a while? Chances are there's a problem with the SQL jobs. We can use the Jobs tab to see what's happening in Upsolver with our jobs. In this view, we can see all of the jobs we've configured in Upsolver. This view gives us a brief overview of each job running on the cluster. We can click on a job to provide a more detailed view of the job. With a job pulled up, you can see if any errors are found. It should give you an idea of what is causing the error. In this example, we intentionally introduced an error by inserting a field whose size exceeds the size we've defined in the target table definition. We'll need to back up and redefine the table's column size to fix the error. This video showed you how to create simple batch pipelines and more advanced pipelines that join data in Upsolver. I invite you to run the code for yourself using SQLake and the template we created that contains all of the code we covered in this video. If you want to go deeper, please watch the other videos covering more advanced use cases such as making real-time data pipelines. Thanks for watching.